This is Twit. So whether you're a YouTuber getting rid of your getting your dad fired over your first look at the uh, iPhone or your regular Apple review, we're given only a few minutes with a new phone. There are certainly no shortage of iPhone 10 reviews out there. We are excited to talk to Mark Spoonhauer, editor in chief of Tom's Guide and Laptop Mag. Welcome to the show, Mark. Oh, thanks for having me. So first things first, how long have you had your review unit? Uh, well, right now it's all a blur. <laughs> so, uh, I think it's been, I think we're going on four days now. Uh, I think, we, yes, we picked it up on, on Monday. Yeah. So so you said it, it's in your review, your, first, your main review, you guys tested the battery, you tested the screen, but you said there's, it's striking not just what Apple added, but mostly what they left behind. Uh, talk a little bit about yeah. that. Sure. Um, it actually reminds me, I don't know if you guys remember, the very first time that Steve Jobs showed off the original iPad. And so he, remember he, like, he sat down on the couch and he was really talking about how they were trying to remove the obstacles between you and your content. And this sort of reminds me of that in, in a different way. Like, so now like, they're getting rid of the bezels, which everyone has complained about. The Galaxy S8 obviously got there first uh, and other phones since then. But there's just people who are just wedded to the, you know, the iOS ecosystem and, and Apple and they've been waiting for something that really looks like a, a new design. And, and this and this does that because you're getting a fairly big five point inch five point eight inch screen. It's something that's easy to use in, in one hand. You know, so I have it right here, and I'm one who um, who's I'm always carrying the iPhone Seven Plus, and I like having the big screen, but I hate the fact that it's actually bulging out of my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> and what, do you, what do you say about the display? Because I mean, this is yeah. uh, the first OLED uh, display on an iPhone. I didn't yeah. realize this because I, I do a show on. Uh, Call all about Android. We talk about Android. So, of course, the Pixel 2 has been a big discussion with OLED and Blue Tilt. And the other night on yep. the show, our guest said, well, the iPhone 10. apparently, some people are seeing this here as well. Did you notice this? What do you think about the display itself? Well, we're not definitely not noticing the color shift, but what we are noticing is actually it's a lot brighter than other OLED panels. And I think what's ironic about this is that Samsung is reportedly making the OLED screen for the iPhone 10. And yet, this is actually brighter, it has wider viewing angles, and more natural-looking colors. So what you're showing right there is one of the photos that we took for the review, and that was outdoors. The other thing that's worth noting is that right now, I have the screen turned down pretty far in order for you guys to see it. And that's partly because the screen brightness is over 540 nits, wow. which, is, which is brighter than the other phones that we've tested. Um, obviously, uh, <laughs> you can see that I'm having a little issue with the interface, and we'll get into that because there is a learning curve in terms of getting around the iPhone 10. Uh, but so far, just in terms of screen quality, uh, we think it's the best OLED panel on a phone yet. So yeah, let's get right into that. I mean, what is the learning curve? Why is it hard, difficult to, to navigate? Yeah, well, it's partly because there's no home button, right? So you have to get used to these gestures. And just like something that's very simple, like checking your battery, right? So a lot of people are talking about the notch that's right up here. Uh, and it is a little bit of an eyesore, but it's not just about that. It's the fact that you have to swipe down from the top here just to look at something like your battery percentage. Because I was, I was looking for a way to enable that in settings. And as it turns out, you, you can't do that. But as you also notice, that that's how you access Control Center now, too. You have to swipe down from the top in order to see that. The other thing is just how you get around apps, too. So if you want to, let's say, open the app switcher, there's no home button to double-click now. You have to swipe up from the bottom of the screen. Let's see. So you got it right there. See? And then to close apps, this is one of the things that, that actually annoys me. Like, you would think that just like the iPhone today, you would just swipe up on one of these apps to close it. But that's actually not how it works. You press and hold, and then you swipe up. Yeah, I don't like that as much. Yeah, and, and I, I, hate, I hate when you add an extra step to something that used to be simpler. You know what I mean? I feel like we see this time and time again. Because you don't really have to get rid of those, right? I mean, you don't, like, it's not wasting battery. They're, running in, they're not running in the background, those apps. No, no, no. So, so I think, right, you don't have to close, you don't have to force close apps. Um, but if you want to, it's just a little bit annoying that they add the extra step. I know why they did it, because when you want to basically you know, open the app switcher, that gesture is what does it. And they didn't want people to just like keep doing that and then swipe an, an app off the screen. But I still think they could trust us. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, this is Apple. So if the user making the decision sometimes doesn't fall into their playbook. So obviously there's a little bit of a learning curve because yep. they are changing the way that you interact with this. Um, mm -hmm. but, did, but is it an improvement? Because, I mean, it, with any change, it's weird at first and then you get used to it and then it's just the way it is. Uh, yeah. Or if this is someone's first iPhone, they're going to get used to the way it is because they have nothing to compare it to. Is it a change for the better? I think that over time that... Most iPhones are probably going to go in this direction. Like once you not you don't have the bezels anymore, I don't think they're going to be bringing the home button back, right? So there's going to be like a whole generation of iPhone users who are going to get used to the iPhone 10, and I suspect that this technology is going to trickle down and the gestures along with it. So yes, so there is a little bit of a learning curve, but it is starting to become second nature for me, especially for things like Control Center and exiting apps and that sort of thing. I think part of the issue is that my everyday phone right now is still an iPhone 7 Plus, and so I have to I have to train my brain based on what 
phone on the whole day. So you did review it also against the eight. Um, what, what would you say to people? I mean, who needs the 10 and who needs the eight? Yeah, I mean, if you're talking about need, then the iPhone 10 is not for you. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's, about, it's, it's about want. Uh, and I think, you know, the big reason is the design. We want something like the, oh, and, and the screen itself, right? Because I really do like the natural colors of the LCD that the iPhone 8 and the 8 Plus have. But there's something about this is Goldilocks effect. Like the iPhone 10 is just right because you get a big screen and something that's almost the same size as the regular iPhone 8. And when you put a 4.7 inch screen next to a 5.8 inch one, <laughs> the other one just seems antiquated at that point. Mm -hmm. And so, what about the battery life? I know you guys did some battery testing. Uh, what did you yep. think of the battery life for the 10? I, it was good, uh, but definitely not best in class. We got about 10 hours and 40 minutes on our lip surfing battery test, and we do that for all of our smartphones. So as you can see there, it's, it's sort of in the middle of the pack, right? So it's definitely above average and better than the iPhone 8. And if you think about what Apple promised, they said it's going to be two hours better than the iPhone 7. And based on our testing, that was almost the case. But as you can see there, there's a couple of phones that last a little bit longer. And we're a little bit different than other outlets because a lot of them just say, like, anecdotally, this is what I got based on mixed usage. We are very scientific about it. We set the, the brightness at 150 nits, and we calibrate it, calibrate the strains. We have our own battery test, and it searches the web over LTE. We also try to use the same network, too. So in this case, we use T-Mobile, which uh, in our test, it might sound weird, but we found them to offer the best battery. So it uh, lasts longer than the 8, but not as long as the 8+. Plus. Yeah, so, so above average. Like the iPhone 8 Plus lasts a little bit longer, at least based on our test. But the one thing to keep in mind is that when you have a web surfing battery test, what's on the screen most of the time is a white background. And OLED panels really excel when you have blacks on the screen because they don't have to use as much power, actually no power, in order to, to show the darker colors, and especially like perfect blacks and that sort of thing. Um, so it's going to vary based on what you have on the display. But we do our apples-to-apples -apples comparison, and other OLED screens uh, last a little bit longer. And I don't think we can talk about the iPhone 10 without uh, discussing a little bit your experience with Face ID. Do you have an Apple <laughs> twin to compare uh, your experience with, or how? That, actually, actually, I do. Oh, no, I do. I have a, I have an identical twin. We did not try it yet, uh, but he actually he looks a little bit different than I do. So I, I, I'm pretty sure that I, he wouldn't be able to fool it. And some of the video videos that I've seen, I mean, it, it was really hard. Granted, I don't know these people, you know, these identical twins, but it would be really hard for me to tell what is different between the two. Yet the phone was able to determine that. Yeah, so I would say it's very sophisticated, and it works really well, uh, especially, I, I was impressed, like, just using it in bed and in the dark, the fact that it was able to recognize my space and then mod me in, uh, and I think that in certain ways it does surpass Touch ID, especially, like, as someone who, like, <laughs> works and uh, uses their phone at the same time and eats lunch at the same time, uh, if you have anything on your fingers, whether it's crumbs or sand or anything else, it, or sweat, you can't log into your phone, right, when you're using Touch ID, so this eliminates that issue with, with Face ID, so I do give Apple credit. And I think the facial recognition is more sophisticated than what the Galaxy Note 8 has. There's a reason why they had to use both facial recognition and iris recognition. It's almost like, we don't have something that's great, so here's a couple of options. <laughs> uh, but there are some downsides to Face ID, and one of those is speed. Mm, so it's not that fast. So it, it really depends on, like, so I'm a power user, right? And I'm opening my phone, like, hundreds of times a day, or more than it's probably healthy. But in those, what, what I timed is something along the lines of about a second and a half to get into your phone versus less than a second for a Touch ID. And the reason is, is that with Touch ID, you could just lay your finger on the button and get into your phone without even having to fire up the display, right? So on the iPhone 10, you have to wake up the display. Even if you raise to wake the phone, it still takes a second for the screen to pop on, and then you can start you know, swiping up. But one tip that I have for folks when they get the iPhone 10 is that don't wait for that little icon to unlock at the top of the screen that tells you that Face ID has worked. Just start swiping up because it's already trying to recognize your face, and I almost never tripped up the iPhone 10 that way. So it's a nice little tip. I was going to say just take a deep cleansing breath while you're waiting. <laughs> yeah. Maybe ask yourself, do I need to open my phone 100 times a day? <laughs> so it takes some me time. Yeah, exactly. One yeah. second every single time you get into your phone, that adds up to a lot of me time. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Mark, so I, I, I know it sounds nerdy, but, uh, <laughs> but, I, but I do think, I do think that the True Depth camera offers a lot of other cool features, and you know, we can get into Animoji, but I'm also curious to see what developers do with it, too. Yeah. So, so you like the camera? It's been taking some good pictures, and you've been sending some Animoji to people? Yeah, uh, we actually did a face-off between the iPhone 10 and the Pixel 2 in our limited amount of time with both phones, and they tied. Uh, so they both excel in different areas. So what you can see right there is that that was a portrait shot that we took, not with the front-facing camera, the back camera. And one thing that we that we think that the iPhone 10, one area where it excels, there's actually two things that you're seeing in that image. I actually like the warmer skin tones from the iPhone 10, um, and also the bokeh effect from the, the dual lenses is more natural 
on the iPhone 10 than it is on the Pixel 2. And that's because Google is using software. They're processing the image after the fact. But the other thing that you're showing right there is me at a, at a local bar, and there's a huge difference in low light performance between both phones. You see how the candle is blown out with the iPhone 10, and then it's not on the uh, Pixel 2? Oh, yeah. yeah. It looks good. It's definitely got a little bit of grain in both issues, and in both um, samples, but yeah, yeah, you get a lot more depth of, of information uh, on the Pixel 2 comparatively. So um, when we do photo face-offs, like, we really try to declare a winner because, frankly, it's, it's just more fun and get more comments. But in this case, like, we really went back and forth, and it was the dead heat between uh, both phones. But I do think that Apple has a little bit of an edge here in imaging because you get a 2x optical zoom, and you don't get that with the Google Pixel 2, but you do with the, the Galaxy Note 8. Hmm. Well, Mark, thank you so much for joining us. Mark is the editor-in-chief of Tom's Guide and Laptop Mag and is M. Spoonauer on Twitter. Uh, we look forward to reading more of your hardware reviews. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Mark. All right, thanks, guys.